so we are recording. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Edwige Simon, and uh, I'm the director of the Graduate Certificate in Language Teaching with Technology that is offered by the Division of Continuing Education at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, today, Trent is going to discuss a project uh, that he developed in a course called Tools in Practice that I offered uh, in the spring. And um, this is, um, there will be three webinars, maybe four webinars, where students will be presenting their capstone projects. Uh, so today is Trent's webinar on virtual reality in the target language. And the next webinar is uh, on uh, Diego Rivera's muralism in Detroit. Uh, and um, since you signed up for this webinar, you will get information about the next webinar. It will be on May 26. So before we get started, I just want to say a few words about the certificate program. And I'm going to share my screen. I have four slides, so I'll be quick, I promise. Um, so, um, so the Graduate Certificate in Language Teaching with Technology, it's a, it's a short program offered by uh, the Division of Continuing Education at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, you can take the courses individually, just based on your interests or you can go through the full program. In order to get the certificate in language teaching with technology, you need to complete 12 credits. Um, so I'm gonna go over um, the courses that we're offering this summer. We have four courses. We offer nine, graduates, nine graduate credits this summer. Um, the first course will start June 3rd, and it's a course on second language acquisition. And it's basically a course for uh, word language educators who haven't taken an SLA course in a while and who want to refresh and expand their knowledge of the theory. And it's not really a theor theoretical course. It's not just a theoretical course. The course instructor really connects the theory to the practice. So it's a great course, um, and it starts June 3rd. It's a 10-week course. And we have scholarships available for this course. The scholarships cover 50% of the tuition. And um, you have all the information on our website. I will also share these slides if you want to get more information about this course. The course that starts June 17th is the Language and Technology Foundation, and it's a very practice-oriented, hands-on course for people who want to take their technology integration skills um, um, a step further. Uh, we discuss, um, we discuss um, um, many topics. We discuss the actual standards. We discuss um, uh, the SAMR model. We discuss... Um, copyrights, we discuss ADA compliance, etc. And then the next course um, that will start after that is the Digital Games and Language Learning course. It's an eight-week course that starts July 1st. Uh, and it's a course that's really dedicated to um, serious games. Um, and um, it, it, it's, really, it's a really great course. Um, and finally, the last course is called Telecollaboration Exchange for Language Learning. And it's a six week course that starts July 8th. And this course is for language teachers who want to work on their own, uh, command of the target language. So if you have any questions, visit the website or email me after the presentation. And with no further ado, I'm going to let um, Trent. Um, give his presentation on uh, virtual reality in uh, the language classroom. Trent, I'm going to unshare the screen so that you can take control of the screen. All right. Well, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today, and I'd like to wish you a happy Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. All right. Yes. My goal today is uh, to show you that you don't need to be a Jedi master to integrate VR activities into your language classroom. So this is my first time giving a webinar, so I may be the one who's, uh, who needs the force to be with me, but we'll, we'll see how this goes and hopefully uh, you are learn from it and can find something uh, that you guys can apply to uh, your classes. So all jokes aside, um, in this webinar, I'd like to share with you not only a project that I did for one of the certificate classes that Edwige mentioned, but also show you how easy it actually is to replicate and uh, provide some ideas uh, and resources for designing VR activities of your own that both you and your students can create and participate in. So let me go ahead and get my presentation going. Here we go. Theoretically working. So the title of my project uh, that I created was Virtual Reality in the Target Language. And so when uh, 
when I was doing some research for <coughs> Uh, I noticed that a lot of the research uh, into VR or simulated environments such as Second Life or World of Warcraft, uh, it was for a means of connecting language learners, instructors, native speakers, and authentic material. It was more of an, of an interactive thing where students were um, interpreting things that they encountered. Um, but it all focused on kind of that, that interaction with other people or simulated content. Um, students were very rarely actually creators of that VR content themselves, uh, largely due probably to inaccessibility of the technology or the high technical proficiency kind of needed in order to, to build those things with coding. Um, but thanks to advances in technology and uh, proliferation, proliferation of things like smartphones um, and emerging technology, got Google Cardboard's very cheap now, um, that putting students in control is much more feasible now. So when I saw that we had to pick out a project and uh, one of our units was actually going to be on virtual reality and Google Cardboard, I knew that I wanted to do this as my technology integration project. So I'd like to first give you a little bit of an overview of my project. Now, I'm an adjunct instructor at Broward College in South Florida. And so unlike maybe a high school or a middle school, I have students who have a very wide range of backgrounds. I have the typical 18 to 24 year olds. I also have students who are dual enrollment and in high school. And then I have people uh, in the workforce that are either currently working or returning to school. So I have a wide range of uh, backgrounds and also technical expertise. And so I tried to pick things that maybe sound advanced, but were actually very easy for anyone just to pick up and do. And so as far as the level of language for this particular activity, it was for a French 2 class, second semester, so French 1121. Most of the students were novice mid, novice high, so this wasn't some advanced level of language ability needed. And I'll talk at the end, there are ways to even do this in a, in a complete novice low class and do some, some very beginning stuff as well. Um, quick summary of the activity of what I did. Um, I had students use mobile VR technology, specifically Google Cardboard headsets like you see in the picture, uh, and the, the Cardboard camera app specifically, which is from Google directly, uh, to not only create and share, but also narrate immersive snapshots, illustrating how they spent their spring break. So we spent about two-ish weeks um, working on the project and dedicated three class days to it. Now, as far as the materials that were needed for this, uh, there are really only three main things. The first thing, of course, was a smartphone, which thankfully everyone in the class had one. Uh, if, you, if you have students that don't have one, you could use a, uh, a regular photo and just have them do a low-tech version of the activity. I'll talk about some other um, alternatives in case you have some tech issues later. But a smartphone that's pretty ubiquitous nowadays, so pretty, pretty accessible. Um, also is the Cardboard Camera app, which is completely free, which is awesome. Um, it's also available for both iOS and Android, so there's no issues of, oh, this person has an iPhone, this person has a Samsung, blah, blah, blah. Everybody can use it. I only had one student that wasn't able to download the app, and that's simply because they had never updated their phone's operating system. So the new version of the app was not compatible with their old operating system, so it took them you know, an extra day to go update their phone, and then when they were able to download it. So otherwise, we had no issues with the app itself. And then, of course, cardboard headsets. Now, this is kind of the sticky part. Um, they're pretty cheap, thankfully, about $10. Um, you can probably get some support, maybe from your department or your school or a grant, to get some funding to get some of these. Um, I actually was not able to, so I had to purchase my own. So I found some pretty cheap ones for about $6, so that if uh, something happened to them, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, but nowadays, it's, it's hopefully going to be a pretty easy sell to, to help some, get someone to help you cover those. One of, uh, one of my classmates from uh, for this course actually was inspired to do a similar activity, and she did get funding from her department to buy headsets for her class. So especially if you sell it as something that multiple disciplines, multiple courses can use and recycle and show off some very simple activities that don't require a lot of preparation, it's probably going to be easier to write something or get some sort of support for that. Um, but you could also even not necessarily have one for every student, you could have them share. So that's, it's pretty flexible in how you, how you plan around using the headsets, however many you are able to access. Um, now for my project, I had kind of four main learning objectives that I had set to kind of track students through it. The first one was simply creating and sharing these simple VR environments using their smartphones. So just being able to record um, a scene and then share it with other people in the class. That was the first one. 
The second was then actually applying the language skills to it. So they needed to narrate a short series of events using past tense. We had just finished a two chapter section on the passé composé in French too, with both avoir and être. So just describing, you know, this happened and then this happened or I did this. Um, just creating a short narration of events. And then using both familiar vocabulary from French 1 and 2, and we just finished a chapter on vacation, so destinations and activities. And so that kind of played right into us having spring break. So it was pretty easy. They didn't have to do a lot of extra work to, uh, to then describe what they needed. The third thing was understanding the oral descriptions from their peers. So when they would narrate uh, and describe their pictures to their classmates, their classmates need to be able to understand what was said. And then following up on that, the classmates that were listening had to pose simple questions to continue the conversation. So there was kind of a back and forth. It wasn't just a pure presentation, but there was some aspect of interaction uh, between their, their audience and, uh, and the presenter. Now these kind of hit on a couple of different things as far as standards go. Language standards, we had presentational speaking, obviously from you know, narrating, describing the pictures, and then a little bit of interpersonal communication by asking and answering questions at a simple novice level. And 21st century skills that kind of got integrated, we had creativity and innovation. The students got to pick what they wanted to document and how they did so. They got to use their technology in a new way and then build technology literacy as well because they were able to take a device they were probably pretty familiar with and use it for a, a new kind of task and develop a new skill that they may not have uh, had beforehand. So that's kind of the learning objectives that I set. And the actual activity outline, the way we did it across our, our three days. Now, our first day, I spent about 15 minutes talking about it because it was our last day before spring break. So I took the last 15-ish minutes of class and I introduced the activity and the instructions. And then I also took that time to hand out the physical headsets and demoed for them so that everyone right there could hands-on do it. Um, how to open the app, how to look at pictures, how to open them up, how to put it in the headset, how to look around, and then as well how to record the picture themselves, how to use the camera function, you know, and turn in a circle and get the 360 panorama. And it was funny because I was really concerned about, you know, everybody being on the same page and being able to do it. But before I even finished demoing the, uh, the recording or even handing out the headsets, I already had students, you know, looking at their second and third pictures. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I can't wait for you to get your headset so you can look at what I'm looking at. So it was actually really, really relieving for me to see that. And so I took, this is the panel I'm actually took, you know, explaining to them. And you can see they are all diving right in on their phones. They have their headsets. Um, so that was a big relief. They had no issues whatsoever apart from uh, the main issue people had was if they had some of those phablet phones that are enormous. I bought the regular size headsets. They do make custom ones for bigger phones. So in that case, we had a few issues. Uh, but because so many people were able to easily understand it, they were all helping each other. So I didn't have to run out answering 9 million questions. Their, their friends at their tables were just saying, oh, here's how it works. Let me show you. Let me help you. And so there was very little intervention that I had to do. They all kind of understood it or uh, were able to help each other. So that was our, our first day, uh, like I said, 15 minutes. And then we went into spring break. And so spring break, the amount of time they spent on this kind of varied. It was up to the individual person based on the assignment. I told them that they needed to create three panoramas, three pictures. Uh, if they wanted to take more, they could and then select from that their three favorite, but they needed to make at least three. And then for each one, they need to draft a one to two sentence caption for each scene. So just a basic, you know, if you're showing this to somebody, what are we looking at and what did you do in this place? And so I, uh, I made an example for them for my spring break. So here I went to a, a French bakery and ate some, uh, some pastries and drank coffee. So I have my panorama that I made and then I made my simple two sentence uh, description. Je suis allé une boulangerie française, je mange des pâtisseries et bu du café. So very simple using all the vocab we'd seen on food from earlier in the semester and very simple past tense sentences. So they just needed to draft those. So they had plenty of time to reflect and think about what they wanted, pick and choose. If they did an activity that was maybe too hard to describe, they were able to you know, pick another one instead or uh, go look up a word or two, that kind of thing. And then when we came back our first day, back on our second day, we spent about 30 minutes 
doing a, a brainstorm peer editing kind of activity to help them use those drafts that they'd written and kind of perfect them. So I had them on a big piece of paper, write the place that they went and the activities that they did. And then they went around the classroom, looked at other people's papers, and then just wrote simple questions or question words next to it, just to kind of get them thinking about how can I add very easily a couple extra words to my sentence to make it a little bit more descriptive, to make it a little bit longer uh, and a little bit more complex. So we did that, and when we finished, uh, I divided them into groups of three. That way, you know, I wasn't gonna be able to have them present everybody, show all three pictures to all 25 students. That was not gonna happen. So I divided them up into groups of three. And so for homework for our last day, they needed to do two things. The first was record and submit audio description. So whatever their final versions that they arrived at of their Google picture captions, they had to record an audio of that and send it to me. That way, when we presented in class, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't, wasn't going to be able to listen to every single presentation, but that way I could give them feedback on their pronunciation and that kind of thing on my own time and they didn't have to worry about that pressure in the moment. That allowed them to then, when they come into class, present to their partners. And then the second piece of homework was to share their actual panoramas with their groups and with me as well so that I had the reference. And so I walked through with them at the end of class, okay, here's the picture you've taken, how do you then share it with somebody? How do you either you know, create a link and send it via text or via email? So they had several options about how they wanted to get, get the pictures to their partners. And then I also showed them, okay, once you've received the link or the text, how do you actually get it into the app? How do you open it and then view it? So we walk through all of those steps. Again, it's very straightforward. It's very easy. Um, there were very few complications with that. So that was their homework to record and then share their pictures so that we could come to class on our last day and spend about 30 minutes actually presenting the panoramas to their groups. They divided up into their groups of three and they took turns describing the three different pictures. So I have some pictures of, of that process there. They were all looking at it and I gave them a little, a little worksheet to help them out, kind of a, a scaffolded guide so that when they were asking and answering their questions, they had a basic formula of, oh yeah, remember how we asked questions? You can use inversion, you can use escrow. Here are some question words you might want to use. Here's some good vocabulary or verbs if you're having trouble getting ideas. Um, so I tried to help them out with that. And so they could ask simple questions and record those for me so I could see what they asked uh, on their paper. And then they had to answer it back and then just write down what the person said about their, uh, their activity. And then once we finished that, uh, I gave them a few minutes to evaluate the activity. I had a little survey feedback form just to see what they liked, what they didn't like, what worked for them, that kind of thing. And so uh, I have a couple uh, examples I'll show you here in a second. But the, uh, the student evaluation itself, uh, that was pretty interesting for me. From their perspective, they had several things that they really liked. Their favorite thing, absolute number one, nearly every single person said this, was experiencing their classmates' vacations and lives outside of class. Especially for a college class where you're not in high school of seeing these same people for you know eight hours a day, five days a week. When you see each other an hour and a half, twice a week, it's very easy to have to be one person you talk to that you sit next to and you don't even know anyone else's name. So this was really cool for them. That they were able to bond and form more of a community than you would typically get in a, in a college level classroom. Um, and so they were really interested in each other. And so a lot of students lamented maybe, oh, I, was, I didn't do anything interesting. Like I was at home, I played with my dog, I went to the park, that's boring. Other people went to other cities. But people really enjoyed just putting themselves in someone else's eyes. Even if it was the most mundane you know, activity, they really enjoyed just being able to see from someone else's perspective. So I thought that was pretty cool. They also really enjoyed using this new technology. No one in the class had ever used a, uh, a VR headset before. Some of them had heard of them, or maybe they'd seen some of the really elaborate versions for video games, but they'd never used them themselves. And I actually had two or three students that decided, this is so cool, I'm gonna go buy my own. And so over spring break, they came, they came, bought some and came back and they actually had to upgrade, had a, a fancy plastic version that they brought to class. So I was, uh, I was entertained to see that they got really into it and wanted to do this outside of class, maybe probably not with French, but you know, do other activities using this technology. Okay. Now, the flip side, things that they didn't like, which is important to, to gauge and either you know, address or ignore accordingly, but uh, things that they didn't like, forming questions was again, pretty uh, common answer for things they didn't like. So imagine that, the part where you actually have to interact with other people and talk and understand and respond in the moment they didn't really care for. So, you know, I tell them, we have to practice that, you know, and so there were some issues with asking questions, which I'll get to in a second. 
Um, but they didn't really enjoy that as much as the fun part per se. Um, the only other thing that they really didn't, um, that they had some trouble with was their inability to take pictures in key moments. A lot of them maybe did something really exciting, but they couldn't really stop for 30 to 45 seconds to turn in the circle with their phone and take a picture of it. Um, and so we had a few of those where it was like, well, I did something fun, but you can't really see it in the picture. I have to take a picture next to where I did the fun thing, um, which I mean, allowed, allowed them to give a description later, um, but they kind of lamented that. And then of course you had people that forgot to take pictures or did, not, did some boring things in their opinion. And so that was kind of a complaint on their end a little bit, um, was remembering to actually take what they deemed as interesting pictures. Even though most of their classmates, like I said, didn't seem to criticize the content of the photos very much. And so for those that were able to take photos, I have a, a few that I wanna share with you. I actually had one student who went to France over the over spring break, lucky her. And so she, she shared several pictures. So here's one of her panoramas from in front of the Louvre. Uh, she also went to Versailles and a couple other places. So her group was really excited to see her pictures. They were very jealous. Um, had some other people, they went to uh, Washington, D.C. So here you have a panorama of the National Mall with the Washington Monument on one end, and then you have uh, the Capitol building on the other. And then even if they didn't travel, um, students enjoyed taking pictures just of kind of regular things around town. Like I said, we're in South Florida, so I've got the beach and the sun. Um, and so just going to the beach and just showing a normal day uh, there, people enjoyed sharing that, their favorite spots to go hang out. Or even if it was, I chilled at home and did nothing. We got lovely panoramas of people uh, sitting at their house, maybe on the canals um, and, and sharing that. So we had a quite, variety, quite a wide variety, even had a few students that uh, uh, sneakily took photos at work. So we had someone who's a, a restaurant server and they're like, hopefully nobody noticed this. Uh, so there were some interesting uh, panoramas there. They weren't all just typical vacation stuff. We had a nice mixture. So that was cool to see. Um, students showing off their, their daily lives. Now, as far as my opinion about how the activity went, uh, the students enjoyed it and thought it was fun. Um, I had a, a lot of positives to say about it as well. A lot of things worked really well. First of all, student excitement and engagement. We all know that trying to get students to care about things that don't necessarily relate to them is pretty tricky. Um, and especially in a, at a college classroom where students aren't required to actually be there and you often have students that show up just for key days and don't come the rest of the time. Uh, we typically run maybe a 75% attendance rate. This was one of the few days where absolutely everybody showed up. It was a 100% attendance, which was pretty remarkable given the number of days out of the semester that that actually happens. Um, so I was, I was uh, pleasantly surprised by that. Everybody did take pictures too, which there's always, you know, that person who doesn't do the activity. Everybody did take pictures, so that was good. There was something to present. Um, something else that worked really well was there were very few technical issues, like I mentioned, apart from, you know, a couple operating system updates. People had no troubles actually doing it. I didn't get those panic emails at three in the morning saying, crap, this doesn't work. What do I do? Uh, they all had no trouble whatsoever creating the pictures and then sharing them and viewing them. So that was a big relief considering I had, I had been really worried about how that was going to play out. Um, some things that didn't work though, kind of nitpicking my own activity. Um, the first thing was the group size with our time limitations. I originally picked groups of three because I wanted students to be able to see as many different pictures as possible, which was again overwhelmingly the thing that they really enjoyed about it. The problem though was that I forget how slow students, especially at the novice level, tend to be when working through things, especially in the speaking activity, um, is that we didn't quite have enough time in class for everyone to present to their partners all three of their pictures. So to get that full round of nine, we usually got through about six or seven unless we had a, a faster group and some groups were even slower than that. So in the future, I'd probably cut it down and maybe have you do two panoramas or maybe three for me, something like that. Uh, but it, it was a little bit tricky with our time limitations. Um, the big thing, which I kind of alluded to earlier, was their inadequate question asking proficiency. And part of this, like I said, was my fault because we already did a brainstorming activity where they asked all the simple questions. So then when it came time to ask questions in class, they already knew who, what, when, where, and those basic ones, and they started to wanting to ask more complex questions that we just don't know how to do yet, that they don't have the proficiency for. And so while it's a good sign that they're really invested um, in the activity, really engaged, it kind of was a, a bit of a clunker as far as the activity actually practicing question asking. So I would probably adjust that in, uh, in the future. And uh, maybe the biggest issue 
uh, which is a little bit out of my control, is underprepared students. Like I said, everyone did take a picture, but not everybody actually described their picture. So especially when you have lower level students, they don't have the ability to speak extemporaneously and just create a two sentence description on the spot. And so if they didn't come prepared with a description, even if we did pre-writing activities you know, over spring break and in the class before, it really again slowed the process down and that was a little bit less successful. Um, so there are a few changes I'll make in the future to, to kind of alleviate that. But at some point, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but if they won't do the work, they won't do the work. But thankfully with the pictures, there's at least enough that people were able to engage with each other, um, even in spite of uh, some issues with individual students. Um, now, if you wanted to do this kind of an activity, uh, there are other things that you can do with Google Cardboard, apart from simply taking a panorama and then describing it. Uh, some other ideas, maybe alternatives you might want to do. Uh, with the Cardboard Camera app itself, it actually has a really cool audio recording integration feature. I didn't use this in mine, but what it does is while you're taking the panorama, it will allow you to talk at the same time and it makes it one embedded file. So when you share it, they have the panorama and when they view it, they're hearing that person talking at the exact same time as they look around. And so because mine was past tense what they had done and we wanted to focus on that past form, I didn't have them record in the moment speaking in the past tense. Um, but if I were to do something with maybe my French one class, we have a unit on the house and furniture and prepositions. And I usually have them, you know, either take a picture of a room or something like that and then describe their room. You could easily use something like this. So they could pre-write a basic script about what's in their room, where it is, what color it is, things like that. And then record their script while they turn around in their room. That way the other students can then view uh, the room with the audio narration at the same time in that headset. So that's a pretty cool feature that you can uh, use it for other things. Um, a little bit more of an advanced thing that I wouldn't recommend unless you really enjoy tech and uh, that kind of stuff, but actually editing the panoramas, it is possible to take a picture with the cardboard camera, pull it on your computer, split it into its parts, mess with it in Photoshop and put it back together. It's a complicated process that is, there's not yet that I found an easy consumer friendly version of doing this. Um, but when, in my experimenting, I played around a little bit with it. I uh, did a couple uh, professional development activities where I actually did a Pokemon theme, Pokemon Go theme, scavenger hunt. And so what I did was I took panoramas of different places around our conference room. And then they would go there and then they would have to use the VR headsets after scanning the, uh, and receiving the panorama and then actually look around to receive a clue. So if you see on the PowerPoint here, you have this uh, a little creature over here that says, oh, hey, there's something over here. So they had to then know, oh, I have to go look under this bench to find the thing that I'm looking for. So it was a way of kind of creating a, uh, an invisible aspect to the environment without using kind of an augmented reality sort of thing. Um, I also did that again with uh, that same class, our conference room there. I, I divided them into teams for part of the activity. So the way that they found out their team was by using those headsets and I got their individual panoramas that were tailored to that room we were sitting in. Um, I also used it in my actual French classes. We did a six day episodic uh, gamified unit where I did the whole thing as a story. And part of it, we were in the catacombs and there were ghosts in the catacombs. So it was again on the Pokemon theme. And so they had to scan using the headsets to find where was the ghost hiding and there was the blood written on the wall that said Sulakab, it's under the table, they had to go look under there. So it was a way of, of using it, maybe the students, you know, it's too complicated for students to edit panoramas, but if you have that ability, you can design activities that involve that kind of augmented or virtual idea. Um, and then if you don't have access to uh, the headsets, there are ways that you can also use web viewers to view this online or view it via your, your phone, but just using the mobile browser of your phone. And so I'll give you some more details about this in a minute, but Facebook has a new 360 function where you can actually take pictures using Facebook and 360 little spheres. Uh, WordPress and other blogging sites have, have recently thrown out um, support uh, for launching these. Same with 360 Player, which is one that I've used for my activities. It's really mobile friendly, so if you're gonna do a QR code, they can scan it and it immediately opens to the app. It's really easy to access. And then if you're more programmer friendly, you've got Google VR View, which is Google's official um, web integration and embedding tool for uh, their panorama. It's a little bit complicated, but if you're into that, there's that as well. Now, some other things, if you want to use other apps, uh, you have Google's Street View, which you may be familiar with the web version, maybe you've already used it, to have students you know, explore around town. And it is completely compatible now 
with the VR headset. So you can actually walk around the town. There's a little button, a little magnet on the side of the headset that you just slide and it will move the panorama for you as you walk around. So you can either have them explore somewhere that you want to send them, either to Paris, Tokyo, wherever. Um, or what I've thought about doing is having them actually pick out meaningful locations and create a tour. So maybe you want to do a unit on uh, their childhood. So they go find their childhood house and they're going to give directions to their friend's house or somewhere their school they used to go to just to kind of give them a little bit more agency because we like to get them involved with things from other cultures, other countries, places they couldn't go to before, which is completely possible. But you could also have it kind of reflect back and have them be able to self-express and pick out things that they want to talk about and that it may be a little bit more daily life for them. That's a way to do that. And like I said, my focus for all of this has been letting students create Google Street View will actually let you create and share your own photo sphere. So you don't have to rely on what other people or what Google has officially made. Part of the app has uh, its own function. There's also a photo sphere separate app that will allow you to create a full kind of bubble around you and put it down on the map and then anyone can view and you can share it directly with people pretty easily. So that's another way to use that to do it, a similar kind of activity. Um, the Google Cardboard official app as well, uh, you can use in different ways. It's not, um, it doesn't have any particular function other than more of like a hub to connect you to demos, and other fun activities that you can do to kind of show off the capabilities of Cardboard. And so some of the interactive demos that they have, you can actually use for interdisciplinary learning. They have some uh, that are like museum tours and you can get some history in there. There's also things um, like with STEM and with science. They have an Arctic journey. That's one of the basic default uh, demos that teaches you about different things about the, the, the climate about the animals and the plants and all that kind of stuff and if you switch a phone over to a different language because it's a google app it will actually switch the whole the whole app into that language so rather than having to you know try and provide the vocabulary to then have an interactive english app they can just temporarily turn their phones to that language and then presto it's all there and it's all kind of interacted with in a very natural way you're not having to force teach any of this so that's an interesting way to have them interact with some other sources that aren't necessarily maybe f part of your unit but could relate or be a branch off to talk about um, a little bit later and there's also some things that are coming soon they don't exist quite yet in the consumer friendly version, but it, the tech is there and it's only a matter of time. The first thing is being able to create and share not just VR pictures and scenes, but actual video. And you can experience these and watch them on you know, YouTube and things where you can put it in the headset and the video is playing and you can turn and look anywhere you want and the video is still going on, kind of like you're actually in there in real life. You can create your own using software such as Video Stitch, uh, which walks you through creating several videos and kind of putting it together. And if you have the money, you can actually go ahead and buy a 360 degree camera. I looked around online and they're roughly $250, $400. So a little bit pricey for an individual, but again, if you could write a good grant proposal, you can maybe get your school, especially if you could sell it as being able to use for all sorts of things. Um, and they go all the way up to $4,000 plus if you want to get a really swanky one. But I feel like it's only a matter of time before your iPhone 10, iPhone 11, your phone camera naturally has that built in. So if you just keep that in the back of your mind, it will eventually probably be much easier to, for students to easily create. Something else even beyond that is being able to create and actually interact with these 3D immersive spaces. Kind of if you think of like, you know, The Sims or something like that where you can build your house and then interact with the things in it. Things like that it already exist and are slowly working their way down from developers to consumers being able to create these kinds of things. Um, you have Pano 2 VR, which is a free software download, um, but it allows you, if you already have modeling experience using you know, Maya or Unity or some one of those programs, it allows you to import and create a Google Cardboard friendly scene of your own. Um, and it has built in some ability to interact with it. Um, A-Frame is another one of those. And even on the most basic level, going back to the Arctic Journey demo that I mentioned, it has a moment where it allows you to build a garden by pointing and clicking and growing flowers. So some of those really basic functionalities are slowly coming. You can imagine how that would allow students to later create worlds and actually interact with things uh, more, more digitally and in this kind of virtual, this virtual world. So those are kind of the extent of my ideas. I mentioned a lot of different resources. So I just want to quickly throw these on the slides, which uh, there'll be a link to at the end. Um, but if you want to share VR scenes and panoramas, I mentioned WordPress, 360 Player, Google VR View, and several others. I gave a brief description of them and provided a link, not just to their main page, 
the, the actual instructions for doing the VR thing that we don't have to hunt around for it yourself. It's just right there. Uh, how to make that work. So really, and if you are into, into editing, if that's your thing, if you're more tech savvy, I do have links to the things that I use to edit my own panoramas. They're a little bit tricky to work with. There's kind of a steep learning curve, but they're there for you if you want to use them. Uh, the cardboard camera converter officially from Google, and then someone put together a camera toolkit to like just split and rejoin uh, various files. And if you'd like to, uh, review some of the things that I talked about today. I do have two videos that I made as part of the class project, talking about the, the overview, the outline of the project, and then how it went, as well as some of those pictures. So I have the YouTube links in there. And uh, apart from that, I have a, uh, that's it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Um, or if you have uh, any other uh, projects you'd like to know about, I do have a website that has all of the same content is there, plus all the other projects that I've done kind of in the same vein are all there. And you can also connect with me on Twitter or other social media. I have a bajillion projects that you're welcome to, to ask about or, or find out more about. But yeah, that's, that's essentially it. Hey, Trent. I see flashing chat window and you can wave down. So what, what are our questions? So we have a couple questions in the chat window. Guys, you're also welcome to unmute your microphones and ask your questions directly. Uh, we have Margot who asked what tool the kids used um, to record their speaking. You said you didn't use the built-in one. Right, so when I've had them do uh, speech recording activities in class before, they just use your phone. All phones, you can't delete it, has the built-in voice recorder, and that's really easy. That's an automatic export email link, you know, a million yeah. ways to share it. And then if for some reason they fail at doing that, they can use their computer or some other device, but usually the phone 99% of the time Okay. Easy to use. And we had another question. Hi, Margo. Mm -hmm. um, I miss you. <laughs> Trent, I miss you too. <laughs> so Margo is another student in the class. She's actually giving a webinar on her project. I'll talk about it at the end of the presentation. Trent, the other question was, what is the name of the app for the panoramas? The app for creating the panoramas? Yeah. Is it cardboard camera? Okay. Cardboard camera. Yeah, I think even if you do like this, uh, search in the app store for Google Cardboard, it's one of like the first three that pops up because it's one of those official apps. So even if you don't get the name quite right, as long as you've got Google and cardboard somewhere in there, it will suggest it within the, the first ones. And um, you have it on your first slide. Yeah, it's on the first slide and then it, with, the, with the materials and it has the picture of the app icon as well, which is, it looks like a little camera made of cardboard. Mm -hmm. oh, I do wish we will we uh, you'll you're recording this so will we have access to it if I want to come back and refer to it yeah I'm so I'm going to put it on YouTube I'm going to email everybody the recording in the slides Great. Okay. okay thank you all the all the resources any more questions okay. about the presentation? I talked about really fast <laughs> I talk great. fast and I'm nervous, so I was like, whoa, that was over quickly. It's good, thank you. Yeah, doing great, thank you. Mm -hmm. so, if you don't have any more questions, I just want to take a few minutes and I'm going to go dig up um, the graphic for um, the next webinar. And the next webinar is Margot and Alandra, and it's also um, it was also one of the projects that they uh, they did in the tools and practice course that they took. Um, in the summer, I'm sorry, this spring. Trying to look for the, um, the graphic. Margo, if you're, since you're here, do you yeah. want to say just a few words about, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you're- Sure, yeah, just, uh, um, so Alondra, who's another student in the course, and I did our project on um, Diego Rivera's Detroit Industry Murals. And so uh, we're going to talk about how the students did that, how we presented it. Um, and then from that, they had to pick, uh, most of them picked a mural um, from one of the great Latin American, you know, the Mexican muralists, um, not all Mexican. And they analyzed it according to the criteria we'd given them. And then they um, did a presentation on voice thread and they commented on each other's work, not unlike what Trent had his students do, but just in a different way. Um, and it, it turned out really well. And um, you know, it was fun to, to read what they had written, and we hope to attract some interest from, you know, anybody who might be teaching art and then, like, an upper intermediate level course. Or, so. I think an interesting part of this project is that Margot is in Germany. 
Oh. Wow. So he paired up with Alandra, who is in the U.S., because he was not teaching at the time. And it happens often, actually, in the uh, certificate courses that some of the teachers who are taking the courses are not teaching at the time. time. So they collaborated, and, and they also talk about that aspect. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to um, dig up the graphic uh, about the presentation. You've probably seen it around. Um, mm. So that's... Um, the, that's the mural webinar and it's May 26th, it's at 9 a.m. and everybody will get um, some information about the webinar uh, via email. It's also uh, on our Facebook page and uh, we'll post it on Twitter. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you very much everybody. I uh, really appreciate um, your presence here today. If you have any questions, um, you'll get trans information, you'll be able to email me, you'll get my information as well. So um, you're welcome to email us if you have any questions. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for attending. Thank you, Trent. Good stuff, thanks.